we were always obsessed when I was working with Peter Thiel 20 years ago with how science fiction had like gotten horrible and turned so negative, right? right. And it's like, cause it's like, it's like science fiction used to be the most inspiring thing in America 50 years ago. How do we bring that back? Do we see it coming back? Are there ways to turn this around? I mean, that's what we're trying to do with EAC. Like let's imagine all sorts of potential awesome futures, like picture them in our, our mind's eye, figure out how, let's back propagate for those ide from those ideal futures towards today, what actions can we take that maximize the likelihood of the advent of those futures and let's do those actions. And that's a really great algorithm to sort of amplify, you know, uh, yeah, the likelihood that, that uh, we make it, um, you know, e Elon is very much the same, you know, has grand, grand visions of the future and he works relentlessly towards them in a sense, like once you, once you identify a positive reward in the future and you, you really model it, your brain just like rewires itself to figure out how to get there. Today we got to talk to the based Bef Jezos. Uh, his real name's Guillaume Verdun. He's a theoretical physicist on the cutting edge of quantum and AI, and he created the EAC, Effective Accelerationism Movement. This is a cause that's near and dear to my heart as an American optimist. It's all about the prosperity of humanity, about accelerating into a future where we're all doing better, where technology is solving problems and making human life more successful. You know, there's a strange thing in our culture where science fiction used to be really optimistic. We used to see really positive visions of where humanity was going to be in hundreds of years in the future. And whatever you believe, whatever you work towards, it tends to bring about that reality. If society sees a positive future where we're in space, we're living on Mars, where people are living hundreds of years long, where we have a peaceful future of exploration, that becomes more likely. If society sees a dystopian future, if they see uh, environmental destruction, if they see negative totalitarian governments, that becomes more likely. It's really important for a culture to embrace these positive visions and for us to have our best and brightest people working towards bringing about those positive visions of the future. And for that, I'm grateful for the EAC cause and I'm excited for you to meet Guillaume. I'm Joe Lonzo. Welcome to American Optimist. Guillaume, wonderful to have you here with us. Well, thanks for having me, Joe. Uh, pleasure to be here. Really excited to chat today. Before we dive in, Guillaume, Let's start with your background. You grew up in Montreal. You did your undergrad at McGill University and grad studies at Waterloo. Tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, I mean, I've been living my life uh, according to somewhat of a, a, a master plan, right? Like uh, li living life like a game. You have a limited time. Uh, you know, you spawn, you start. You got to understand the rules of the game, identify the highest impact opportunities, and then uh, go and pursue them. And so, um, you know, the first phase of my life, uh, I pursued sort of theoretical physics, trying to understand uh, the laws of the universe. Um, really, the the only real laws are the laws of physics at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that that got me to uh, study physics and math at, at McGill University. And then later on, I went to do a master's uh, in theoretical physics at uh, the University of Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. There I was working on really w what are the edges of our knowledge, right? You know, there's uh, the cosmos, uh, the, the grand scale of things, the very small scales, so the quantum mechanical scales. Mm -hmm. So I was working on quantum cosmology, a bit of black hole physics. And there I got really interested in um, uh, information theory, uh, notions of compression, um, because black holes are really the, the densest objects in the universe and they have um, the highest density of information. Tell us a little more about that. that. I'm curious to hear how, how does how does that work in terms of actually information being compacted in a black hole? I know it squeezes all the stuff together, you know, and there's all sorts of interesting formulas at the, at the, at the kind of boundary of the singularity. How does this tie to information yeah. theory? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, information theory is, is, is originally a theory by Claude Shannon, which was, you know, the laid the foundation for computing, but it's also used in, in, in physics to describe uh, thermo thermodynamics of various systems. And, you know, Stephen Hawking uh, very famously worked on the entropy of black holes and their temperature. Um, and there, the information or the entropy of a black hole actually scales with, with the area of the black hole. So somehow it's compressing information of what's inside the black hole into a hologram that scales as the area. And that was very interesting to me. And so I, I, I basically studied that mechanism and other mechanisms that are similar for uh, uh, how does nature actually encode and compress information? And, and can we create algorithms that that decompress uh, that information. And that's actually what got me into uh, considering what would be 
a way to to learn this compression code, inspire ourselves from nature. And that got me into studying uh, a quantum mechanical form of computing and, and trying to define a, a quantum mechanical form of AI. So quantum mechanics, for those not familiar, is the physics usually of the very small things are in superposition. They're very much not like day-to-day uh, -day life. Um, and at the time, you know, it was around 2015, uh, I was seeing that, uh, you know, quantum computing uh, was an area of, uh, you know, global competition. Uh, I was a theoretical phys physicist at the time. I was like, how can I help, you know, in the West? How can I help, uh, you know, at the time I was in Canada, but how can I help Team America? And uh, there I saw quantum computing as an opportunity and bringing my, my, my knowledge from theoretical physics to um, try to create value with, with quantum mechanical computers. So I was basically a pioneer of a field called quantum deep learning. So many people are familiar with deep learning neural networks, but extending those types of notions to quantum mechanical computers and, and, and really defining what does it even mean to have a, a sort of a quantum mechanical deep learning program. Mm -hmm. And um, that journey uh, uh, got me to do a first startup during uh, grad school. Um, uh, and, and during that first startup, uh, I ended up being approached uh, by, by Google uh, to prototype really uh, what would a, a TensorFlow for quantum computing look like. So TensorFlow at the time was the core uh, software framework for Google to do deep learning. Uh, and we wanted to extend that for, for quantum mechanical uh, uh, learning. And so we hacked that prototype with a couple uh, uh, friends that I, I put together at the University of Waterloo nights and weekends. And, uh, you know, uh, they ended up liking it and bringing us on. And that started my journey, you know, within big tech, mm -hmm. within Alphabet. And eventually I, I got out, luckily. A few things you want to pull apart there. So first of all, I love the implication that a base person in Canada is, is implicitly on Team America, which is how the world should, should hopefully work with, with these battles going on. But what made you what made you want to fight for the West? Like how did that, like a lot of people in your position didn't come up with those values. A lot of people at Google don't seem to have those values where, where, you, where you worked for a while. Like where did this come from? I don't know. I, I, growing up, people would say I'm the most American Canadian they know, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, to me, you know, America represents the land of opportunity, land of freedom. Um, it, it's obviously a pioneer in all things uh, science, tech, and R&D. It pushes the boundaries of humanity, and that's the team I'm on, right? Um, and it doesn't matter where you're born. If you identify with those values, you can move to America, you can become an American, and you're welcome, and you can contribute, and that's the American dream. It is, and, and you, you know, move to Texas, too, you know, for those values, too. So, so it sounds like you spent <laughs> some time here. Uh, you, that's right. So at Google, did you find some like minds around this? Was it something that didn't, didn't come up? Did, did it something you talked about with others? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, I, I did find a, a cluster of people that that you know were uh, um, more patriotic, and obviously, uh, I can't talk too much about what I worked on because after that, after working at Google uh, Quantum, I essentially moved to to Google X to work for for you know Sergey Brin and um, uh, other leadership there. Uh, but there, you know, definitely we wanted to uh, work on technologies that uh, uh, are important for uh, uh, this this global uh, competition. And so I, I worked on broader set of quantum technologies, uh, including the, the U.S. quantum Internet. So contributed to the blueprint um, quantum sensing technologies. So how to have very exotic sensors to sense uh, gravity, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, biomedical signals all sorts of uh, signals you can you can uh, resolve. Is this stuff working, by the way, yet in ways that are useful for, for quantum sensors, for gravity and other sensors? Or is, it, is this stuff that we're actually using? Uh, I would say it, quantum sensors and quantum communication are much shorter term technology than, than uh, quantum computing. And that's why I moved towards uh, those fields uh, after subfields after a couple of years in quantum computing. Uh, I, I do think uh, there are very solid prototypes that can resolve um, regions of parameter space in terms of uh, ex acceleration, uh, uh, positioning, and timing uh, that are not possible with, with classical sensors. And now it's a question of miniaturizing and robustifying those systems. But you can imagine a world where, you know, obviously if you, if the first thing that happens in a conflict is GPS goes down, right? Uh, you know, how, how can you precisely position yourself? Um, if you have a very 
uh, fine tune accelerometer, you can just keep track of how much you've moved. That's fascinating. You know, my, my, my cousin at West Point tells me they train with a compass just in case, cause they kind of do assume that these things go down. I, it would be pretty impressive to get all of Elon's satellites out of the sky, but I guess not all of them can be used for, for, for GPS. So, but that, right. That, that, that's, right. Well, thank goodness for Elon. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good thing. But I'm intrigued though, just going again to the point about the West, you said you you just told me you worked at Google X and you're in the, working on a lot of these things that are critical for the global competition. Just, I mean, this is the same time when, of course, when Google Maven was turning down working with the DOD, which was inspirational on, you know, in, a, in a negative way to a lot of us that we had to get more involved and we had to be helping America. But but so was Google X doing this for the reasons of helping the West, or is it more just, or is it more just this is something they're interested in? Because the way you said it, it was almost like you guys are doing this, and it's, and it's really helpful to to the West. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't comment too much on on what we were uh, working on it, uh, and and some of the decisions of the. Uh, leadership there, but you know what I saw um, with my own eyes was that a sort of cultural subversion uh, within big tech more broadly was stopping uh, big tech from working with the government, right? Like yep. basically uh, ideologies that sort of um, were very pervasive within the middle layers of the organization basically made it so that whenever, let's say, Alphabet or other organizations want to work with the government, there's a sort of uh, you know, protest uh, and so on. And how, how convenient is that, you know, for our adversaries that, you know, the, the ideolo ideologies that are pervasive in our uh, most advanced technological uh, firms are, you know, serve, serve our adversaries in, in that, you know, we don't deploy the best technologies to, 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 to the government because uh, of, of these protests. And so that got me really thinking about, okay, there, even if you, you can work on technologies all day, but those that get deployed and funded, um, you know, if, if you don't have a sort of ideological or cultural support for what you're working on, uh, you're not going to get to build and deploy uh, certain technologies. Yep. And that kind of seeded the ideas for sort of cultural engineering, which is, you know, led to eventually to EAC. That's awesome. And so let's go to EAC. I wanted people to hear about your background. You're obviously in the middle of a lot of the cutting edge stuff going on in the world. You're not just a keyboard warrior here. I think it's important context. So EAC, Effective Accelerationism. Like, like, what are the origins of this, and how how do you build this movement? Yeah, I think uh, I think I started it roughly when I was uh, towards the tail end of my stint at uh, at Google X. There, obviously, the baseline is secrecy. I couldn't talk much, and um, you know, about what I do, uh, and and, and uh, can't, couldn't say anything too controversial. And so, you know, I started an alt, uh, alt account, as we say on Twitter, mm -hmm. just to have a sort of really, really, you, you'd be surprised how much one restricts their own speech. When they know they're being sort of observed by by, by peers, by by their potential boss. I've noticed so most of my friends do this. I've gotten in trouble because I don't do that enough. But yes, this seems <laughs> to be what other people do. <laughs> right, right. Because you know, once you have freedom of speech, um, it induces freedom of thought, and all sorts of thoughts uh, you weren't giving yourself the right to have, uh, you can now try to experiment uh, in, a, in a sort of lower risk way. When you have very few followers, obviously now I have a lot of followers and I'm doxxed, so it's a bit more difficult. Um, but uh, back then, I just wanted to exp uh, putting out some ideas that that uh, you know that I thought in private, but that I couldn't discuss with anyone at the time. And it, it sort of grew, right? Because I would I would I'd just say uh, you know hidden truths or or what I thought were, were truths uh, at the time that maybe a lot of people thought in private but couldn't vocalize. And that's sort of how the the account grew initially. And eventually, we we put uh, some of those thoughts into a framework um, uh, that sort of went viral to some extent. Originally, started just discussions. Uh, you know, Twitter Spaces is a great product. You you get to have you know 10, 20 people just have a discussion, just like mm -hmm. a campfire discussion. Like, this is how things really are. Let's let's have a discussion. Where where are things going? Where are we? Where are things going? Uh, uh, and and what can we do about it? And uh, we wrote down some notes. It became a blog post, and then it went viral. And uh, that's that's how EAC started. Really, it was very humble beginnings. So tell us a little bit about that framework you built. What what are some of the first principles? I I, I mean I, I think it's something we're very aligned with. Obviously, on my side, we we're optimistic about the future. You can basically, basically there's all these problems you can actually solve by building, and then things get better that way. What's the framework you you started with? Yeah, I mean the the the, the basic framework uh, comes from you know the study of um, life, biology, uh, adaptive complex systems, basically. Most systems uh, in, in nature that are alive, quote unquote, uh, seek to to acquire resources and utilize them towards their own growth. And that's kind of the basic principle. And 
systems that uh, do this get selected for, like they're likelier to exist in the further future, and systems that don't tend to die out. It's that simple, right? And that, this happens at all, at all scales. It happens at the individual scale, at the company scale, at the nation scale, and at the civilizational scale. So it's so given this, it's like, okay, well, we could be, you know, uh, an empire civilization that, that dies out if we have the, the wrong culture that induces the wrong mindset that leads to uh, decline. So what if we created a sort of viral optimistic movement where we're self-aware that this is the thing we're optimizing for and we're, we're, we're seeking to optimize for the growth of the whole system. And really we're not being prescriptive of how exactly to do this, but rather that we should maintain dynamism, adaptability, and an open mind as to how to uh, uh, engineer this growth. Uh, and so one of the, the sort of core tenets is to maintain variance, maintain adaptability, because you know it's, it's just like an early stage startup versus a late stage company. An early stage startup, things aren't, aren't fully pinned down. You're still flexible, you're still malleable. You can pivot and then identify the opportunity for maximal growth. In a later stage company, mm -hmm. Maybe you have a, a large product, you've pinned down, down all sorts of processes, you're not as malleable, not as flexible. And so maintaining uh, at, at a societal scale, uh, uh, this sort of adaptability uh, uh, is important for us to, to always be of highest fitness towards uh, towards this growth. I want to play a little devil's advocate here to, just to yeah. get just to get some of the common pushbacks to here. And because sure. I'm 100 percent on the side of growth and dynamism, and there's all these ways we're breaking that today. But but uh, but the way you define this, where you kind of want the system to grow and things to get more resources and, and, and let it keep growing and be alive, like how how is that? This is maybe a stupid pushback, but how is that different from a virus that's growing, or how is it different than? Like something that's the, the, you know they could have something that's, that grows that's actually like really really nasty as like some kind of like empire that's nasty to everything around it and just like an evil empire that conquers everything like how would that would that be something that counts as growing really well because it's better at being an evil empire or, or how, 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 do you, how do you think of the, like, the ethical implications and what this is? Yeah, I th I think like um, th there can be fluctuations away from this perfect trajectory of, of growth, but on average they tend to correct on a sufficient time scale. So if you had a Sort of global authoritarian uh, power. Eventually, you know that power would crumble because it's not a, a stable solution. Suppression, mm -hmm. suppressing speech, suppressing people's thoughts, eventually gets disrupted by a society that has way more freedoms, innovates much faster, and outcompetes that that empire. For for a virus, if the virus is far too virulent, right? If it's a if it's like a parasitic growth, then it could kill the host, and then it has no more substrate to grow upon, right? I think it's important to try to explore like what the, the, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the steel men of, of our enemies. So, you know, when I was younger, I've been very lucky myself to grow up as like the like chess champion, math champion, like all these things where, where I'm, you know, pretty competent at things. And so I like really valued like, okay, the smartest people in the world are the ones who are going to make the biggest difference. And they're the ones who drive everything forward. And there's this whole framework around that. You can almost call it a Nietzschean framework where you want like the, the ubermensch to like basically be in charge and run things in, in a way because that's going to make it all more effective. And it's like, Basically, there's this theory that the top, you know, whatever, one or two percent are the ones who are actually driving forward history. Uh, and I think there's a danger if you get like too into that philosophy, which is focused on like competence and growth and the very best people winning, which is that you kind of leave out like the Judeo-Christian background, which is which is that there are I mean, I think a society should be also be measured how it takes care of the people who are on the bottom 10 percent. Right. There are people who are the meek of the earth who depending on your on your view of humanity, like like I, I'm, I'm kind of like radically like like people are radically unequal on their impact but i think like equal dignity of human worth for me is very important and for a lot of people is very important where you do want to take care of the bottom even if maybe you shouldn't be putting them you know putting them in charge so maybe a society if just as an example a, a quote-unquote evil society that just like cut its bottom might actually grow a lot faster in some ways because those people are very problematic whereas maybe a more moral society would still grow but take care of their bottom like how does that fit into eac and how do you, how do you think about that yeah so i, I would say like um religions and, and subcultures, you know, really they're, they're just highly uh, evolved memes, right? You have mimetic co competition for, yep. for subcultures, ways to live your life and different subcultures will confer an advantage or disadvantage to, to, to its adherent and adherents in terms of a, uh, the growth uh, of their, their, their subculture. Uh, and so these religions that have evolved are very well fine tuned heuristics that on a long time scale, ensure sort of robust growth, right? Like who knows, like if, if someone may not be productive now in society, who knows, maybe things change and, 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 and 
uh, their their family becomes like super highly productive, right? Like mm-hmm. down the line. So it's not worth uh, you know cutting out the the, the bottom ten percent. And so um, really like all we're saying is like, we're not saying a particular culture is the way to go. And it's not just about uh, maximal strength uh, at this moment. Uh, it's about uh, search, maintaining a, a broad search over uh, cultures, not enforcing a single monoculture that's top down prescribed, mm-hmm. letting people search over ways that they'd like to live their lives and maintaining that freedom to explore. Uh, uh, that's the important thing because that's always going to, yield a sort of uh, high uh, fitness cultural uh, uh, heuristic uh, yep. at any given point in time. No, it makes yeah. a lot of sense that a lot of evolution works this way. You wouldn't all want to be exactly the same in the species where you might get wiped out. You want to have enough variation to adapt to, to these right. things. And right. so, so and, and why do you use energy as a measure of progress? How does energy tie into that as, as a way to assess this? Yeah, I mean, you know, fundamentally, uh, you know, a- energy and information are, are like the some of the big two observables that we have in, in physics. And really, I want to measure progress that was anchored to reality, that was objective, right? That there was uh, other uh, utilitarian philosophies like hedonism that, you know, uh, they want to maximize some sort of subjective measure like um, uh, pleasure, mm-hmm. for example, right? Hedons. And mm-hmm. that's totally subjective. And that, that leads to sort of like uh, weird optima, like wireheading, like you're just going to plug into the matrix and, and, and press the pleasure button forever. Whereas if we... Uh, seek as an optimum to, to grow the system as measured by a measuring stick that doesn't change, which is like how much energy are we uh, producing and, and, and consuming, uh, um, uh, then then that's a good uh, sort of anchor relative to, let's say, GDP that we can play with, we could fudge with the numbers, mm-hmm. we can inflate the dollar away. Uh, and then we, you know, once we unpinned from, from gold, that was, you know, uh, like our, our measuring stick, a lot of things we the world shifted towards financial engineering instead of, instead of like hard engineering. Yep. And so um, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I, I think every other metric of growth, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is a, could be a projection of, let's say, energetic growth. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the key metric. And at least from the equations of physics, if you consider the whole system of civilization, the equations predict that the system will optimize towards its growth, towards consuming more free energy. Uh, and that's, that's where, where we should go, where the universe wants us to go. Right. So it's fascinating yeah. though, because it does seem that in the last 20, 30, 40 years in the West, like we've been able to grow in like more energy efficient ways. Right. Or, or is that, is yep. that, is that, is that, is that fake? Is there's nothing like growing without energy or, or how, how do you think of that? Yeah. So, so it's both like, gr- I'm not saying like, uh, let's grow, uh, and just burn energy for the sake of burning energy. The point is that it, it's, it's growth on a long time scale. So it's not just the current instantaneous amount of energy we're burning. It's how much we're burning on a long time scale and hopefully that exponentially grows. And so if we're, you, we're not utilizing our current energy in a clever way that leads to further growth, then, then we're doing something wrong. Right. Um, And, you know, a lot of things we do, like, let's say, developing uh, better technologies, using that energy to develop better technologies gives us optionality for for sort of later growth and and helps us uh, unlock that 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 new scale. At the end of the day, sort of um, uh, how much how many humans can we sustain? How big of civilization can we sustain is determined by our level of of technology. And the more uh, intelligences that we have, more humans we have, uh, uh, the more the rate of technology progresses. And we want to sort of keep that that uh, uh, that going, that, that sort of feedback loop going. I'm curious what you think. How many people could we have on the earth at our current level of technology in, in a kind of comfortable, healthy way that we keep growing right now? That's a great question. Um, all I know is that uh, it's definitely bottlenecked by the, the Kardashev scale, which is the measure of how much energy production we have because we can turn energy into food. We have all sorts of chemical processes for that. Um, but uh, definitely seeking uh, forms of energy uh, that are more potent, such as nuclear energy, mm-hmm. uh, which right now it's not necessarily the physics that's a problem. It's, uh, overregulation, yep. uh, right? Uh, that's going to be that's going to be necessary. And so this sort of social movement where we push for less regulation, trying to make people aware that we're there's a huge opportunity cost to slowing things down, uh, is, is really important for us to unlock that that next scale of, of uh, civilization and, and and unlocking the ability to support more humans. Uh, which I think uh, most people would want, but no, hundred percent. I, I feel like with nuclear energy and things like tunnels around our major cities and stuff to get rid of traffic entirely, because you can have like arbitrarily, you know, large amounts of, of going in and out. 
it seems like there's no reason we couldn't have 100 billion people. It's, it's, you know, you can, it's right. still be comfortable. I think people have a bad intuition for this, but people get people hate it when I tell them this. So maybe I, don't, I shouldn't <laughs> keep telling them this. The permissionless innovation is one of your core tenets as well, which obviously that's really key for a lot of areas. That scares a lot of people around things like nuclear. They, they might not don't want you just to be able to do anything with nuclear and cause a cause a problem. Like how, for the boundary cases for that, how do you think about it? Because I'm the regula regulatory states obviously like slowed growth massively. I think overall has hurt people a lot. Uh, how, how do you think of those boundary cases on the, on the edge of regulation for extreme things? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think like our point is not that like nothing should ever be regulated. It's more like the, the pendulum has swung toward, you know, there's been a sort of second law of bureaucratic complexity. It's only mm -hmm. been increasing over time and it, it's massively so, slowed down many industries. For example, you know, nuclear energy has the potential of slowing down uh, AI. Clearly the drug discovery process as well just costs a a lot right now and that's slowed down uh drug discoveries we we don't know really the futures we left behind by by regulating everything this hard right um you know maybe we would have discovered all sorts of drugs uh, right. much faster if, if there were less regulations um but you know th there is already sort of um uh feedback loops that are that are that are natural right if, if you do something terrible to another business it could sue you so that's a negative reward yep. uh, and, and, and other businesses or consumers vote with their dollars. That's like positive reward. So there's a way to have this peer to peer sort of alignment of incentives. And, and that's kind of uh, our point as well about sort of AI. Uh, if you have, um, you know, the trajectory of, of, of uh, AI companies and products being steered uh, by the market, you know, eventually people wouldn't pay for uh, an AI that's unaligned, doesn't do what you say. And as nefarious, right? <laughs> they would pay yeah. for an AI that does, you know, is a good worker. Let's say, uh, is aligned and is reliable, right? And if if uh, if the, you know, the the, the person or, or the company that offers uh, such AI systems could get sued, and and uh, if if their AI is unreliable, then they're going to engineer it to be reliable. So the market is going to sort of uh, drive this sort of demand for for reliable and aligned AI. And I, I don't think like a heavy-handed, top-down regulation that's secretly written by the current incumbents mm -hmm. uh, is the way to go uh, because AI is moving on a time scale of month to month, week to week. And, you know, regulations are on, on a few year time scale at best uh, put together. And that's just too slow of a feedback loop and it's too heavy handed and it's probably not the way forward. So that's kind of our, our, our thesis is that we have to swing the pendulum back towards uh, freedom to innovate. 100%. Yep. I mean, it's the same thing in healthcare in America. All the incumbents write all the regulations, and so you, you can't yep. adapt, and healthcare is like three times as expensive or something as it would be. And it's right. the same thing with AI. They want to capture it. Probably a good idea for them not to capture it. Uh, Guillaume, I want to ask you about your recent posts about hyperstition and how culture correlates to progress or decline. Can you unpack that post? Like, like, like why, why did culture and narrative matter? Yeah. Um, if your editor shows the graph, like, it, it, essentially, over time, we've seen, like, uh, discussions about uh, you know, uh, progress, uh, the future kind of, uh, decline and, and, and more about like risks, uh, you know, uh, words of caution and pe people worrying, uh, which is, which is sometimes natural, but it, it's hyperstition means that, you know, you, you, um, uh, you, you bias, uh, the reality towards the futures you're thinking about. Um, and so if you're obsessed, it's, it's kind of like in a startup as well, right? Like if, if you're, uh, uh, optimistic, uh, uh, you know, you have a shot at, at, at growth and, and, and having a, a successful company. But if you're definitely, you're pef pessimistic, you're definitely probably not going to be successful. Yep. This is like, there's people very close to me in my life growing up who are probably at least as smart as me, but they're more negative and cynical. And so it makes it, I've started all these billion dollar companies because you have to believe it's possible. Otherwise you can't do That's it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You gotta, you gotta believe it's yeah. possible. So we, we have to paint and, and, and think about uh, better futures and then we can, uh, uh, work towards uh, bringing forth their existence, whereas just worrying about uh, 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 you know doom and gloom futures like makes us focus on that. And ironically, sometimes we we engineer the advent, you know, just like I'm going to say it, like you know, we've there was centralized research on uh, um, bio, you know, bioweapon defense, right? Yeah. And and we were worried about a potential virus that could do a lot of damage, and then it was actually accidentally created through that research and because we're, we're going so focused through on sim it. Yeah. exactly and we're going through similar stuff with ai now people are trying to do like sleeper agent lms and so on and so Yikes. it's like well the market wouldn't want to <laughs> create these things right like nobody would would buy uh, a, a a covid virus uh, for fun um from what i can tell and so like the market the market 
uh, gives us a sort of probabilistic safety because it biases, it selects for things that are positive towards growth of the system that are a net value add, not a massive negative value. It's actually fascinating. The government by being worried and negative is actually creating things that would never have existed otherwise. Or in the narrative is, you, you, you know, Guillaume, this is interesting because it actually is like a very personal like framework as well as a societal framework. What I found in my life is that when you actually believe something is possible and you focus on it, you kind of merge, you kind of merge your reality into a reality where it is possible and that you, you bring these right. things about. And we were always obsessed when I was working with Peter Thiel 20 years ago with how science fiction had like gotten horrible and turned so negative, right? right. It's like, cause it's like, it's like science fiction used to be the most inspiring thing in America 50 years ago. How do we bring that back? Do we see it coming back? Are there ways to turn this around? I mean, that's what we're trying to do with, with EAC. It's like, let's like, let's imagine all sorts of potential awesome futures. Uh, let, let's like picture them in our, our mind's eye. Let's, let's, let's figure out how let's back propagate for those ideas from those ideal futures towards today, what actions can we take that maximize the likelihood of the advent of those futures and let's do those actions. And that's a really great algorithm to sort of amplify, you know, uh, yeah, the likelihood that, that uh, we make it, um, you know, e Elon is very much the same, you know, has grand, grand visions of the future and he works relentlessly towards them in a sense, like once you, once you identify a positive reward in the future and you, you really model it, your brain just like rewires itself to figure out how to get there. How do we get more people thinking about these with EAC? Like what's your, what's the strategy? Do we need do, do more better memes? Is, is there like cool, like, you know, <laughs> stories and pictures of crazy fun things we want to create in outer space and Mars? Like what's, what's the, how do we do this? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's been EAC, there's, you know, techno, there's Mark Andreessen's techno optimism. There's all sorts of, of, of variants of this subculture, but really if, if more subcultures uh, that are, are positive about the future, positive about uh, technology enabling, such uh, better futures uh, exist if they become more popular than just by construction, more people will want to work towards those futures that are going to want to work on uh, with innovative uh, companies. And, and we're going to increase the, the likelihood of, 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 of that better future happening. We definitely need better sci-fi. We definitely need to make sure that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot preemptively by panicking about a potential futures, right? The, the, predicting the future is a very high variance prediction. Uh, it, it can be scary and, you know, we can preemptively do much more damage uh, uh, to ourselves with, let's say, overregulation uh, uh, than, than, you know, the damage that would have happened uh, by just letting things uh, uh, happen. Um, and so uh, I think at this stage, there's a danger because we're going through a very rapid shift. There's a danger that this um, disruption uh, and, 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 fear mongering becomes in instrumental towards certain uh, uh, people and incumbents that are trying to uh, gather power and, and, and crystallize their position uh, uh, before, you know, uh, people realize that actually the future wasn't going to be uh, yep. doom and gloom and act actually was going to be great. But now, now you've crowned uh, uh, a couple uh, organizations as, uh, you know, all powerful and you can't go back. And they I was, won't I was give, reading, I was reading something the other day about how a Roman emperor met a guy who had a form of glass that you can hit and it would like, and it could just store it and it would hit it and it fixed itself. And it sounded like they were scrapping plastic and he apparently mm -hmm. just killed the guy because he was afraid that if it got out, it would, it would ruin the, the future because it would make gold and silver worth less because it was a valuable material. But it, it does seem like people are very naive about, I, I wonder how much in humanity in the past has like stopped our advancement just by being scared and naive about these things. There's probably a lot of stories we don't know like that. Absolutely. I mean, we've always been scared of new technology, new knowledge and how it could disrupt uh, the powers that be. Um, and so, you know, here we are at the advent of a new age, you know, we're, we're working on very sophisticated, you know, self-adaptive hardware, uh, that could scare some people, but, you know, we think it's going to really impact the world positively. Tell me about what you're working on now. You, you, you left Google and you've been working on a new startup for how long now? Uh, a year and a half roughly. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're about 20 people. Uh, it's called Extropic. Um, essentially, I had a journey through quantum technologies, and I realized, obviously, those technologies are going to take some time to, to really scale and, and, and mature and get to market. But I was seeing generative AI really become uh, the sort of core workload of a lot of uh, big tech players. And, you know, I came from a background in physics and, and, and really wanted to um, uh, figure out how can we uh, push the limits of computing to the very limits of physics uh, uh, and, and really have the most energy efficient uh, densest potential uh, compute uh, for AI and the oh. densest, fastest, most energy efficient. Because again, I, according to my principles of EAC, 
the more intelligence you have, uh, uh, you know, the faster the progress uh, towards scaling civilization will have. And so making uh, uh, intelligence much cheaper uh, is, is a priority. And so we're, we're engineering a whole new stack. It's called uh, thermo thermodynamic computing because we're operating at the thermodynamic limits, but it's really aiming at uh, speeding up generative AI massively. And of course, like if people are scared of GPUs right now and what current day silicon can do, they're going to be very scared of <laughs> what we're doing. And so I, I knew like if, I, I, if, if we didn't prepare the culture for the advent of the technologies uh, that, 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 that we're building, we might become, you know, outcast or well, hopefully not executed, but, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you get the gist. Um, yeah, they, they'll so. try to do that. I really appreciate that Elon and, and others are even more visible are standing up strong. They're trying to get him. Fortunately, we're still in a free country. They haven't taken him down yet, although they're, they're trying. So let's go one step deeper on the tech just so we understand it uh, for some mm -hmm. of our, you know, for some of our listeners who are more technical. Like, what, what, what are you actually doing? What are you, what are you building? Yeah. So, so essentially, we're, we're building uh, computers for neural information processing. Um, and they harness, they really harness fluctuations of nature and nature's uh, noise. Um, uh, essentially, electrons tend to jitter around, uh, and we can harness that jitter in order to make uh, systems that are far more energy efficient, far more data efficient, and, and essentially do the machine learning as a physical process. Wow. Right? So we're translating between the algorithms that usually run on a digital computer, and we're just instantiating them physically. And that leads to a sort of system that's not alive, but you know, it's 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 uh, adapting by itself, and it's 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 quite interesting. And and you know, obviously, for all the players today that are spending billions and billions of dollars on compute, this could be a, a big game changer. What's so, your, what's your you timeline? Know. You think to get this to being being able to be used? Do you have a good sense? Um, I mean, uh, I'm, I haven't announced any prototypes yet, but uh, you know, we have we have our first uh, test chips, and uh, we're iterating. But I think a couple years from now. We'll be able to have this in, in production. That's very cool stuff. Well, I gotta make sure we learn more about it before we lose you, Guillaume. I was just looking ahead. What's next for the for the EAC movement, and, and how are you thinking about affecting policy? How are you thinking about like like what what do you, you want to do with this movement? What else do you want to push with it? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. So far, it's just been very organic scaling. We haven't had a sort of top down control. There's no centralized organization. You know, even the merch, I didn't even produce these. People gifted them to me, right? It, it, it's been very permissionless. Like you, everybody can contribute to it. So we do want to keep that aspect, but figure out how to scale it. But we we are, you know, we do have to have a voice, let's say, you know, in Washington as these um, uh, legislations are, are, are being pushed through or there's attempts to push uh, legislations through to s sort of um, stop open source uh uh, from from uh, uh, growing and competing with big tech, for example, uh, by saying it's a dual use technology, uh, which you know we think is egregious, um, uh, or you know uh, give a sort of regulatory moat to to the incumbents that that we need to stop in order again to maintain sort of this equal opportunity to build this freedom to compute that is so important for you know innovators to just come forth and and be able to participate in in accelerating. Uh, you know, AI progress and tech progress at large. One hundred percent. Well, I you probably know I have teams in eighteen states, and I just hired some people who are great in DC just for purposes like these. I know Mark Andreessen and his team spending seventy five million dollars for the first time hiring people in DC to fight for these values. So you have you have a bunch of allies out there. If you see stuff, you should make sure make sure you flag it. You got a bunch of people eager to help with that. A final awesome. question, Guillaume. Other than what you're working on, what innovation or technologies excite you the most right now, and how do we get people to sense? that humanity is really just scratching the surface of its potential and there's, there's so much more out there. Yeah, I would say, you know, obviously the technologies for software in, in terms of intelligence and, and artificial brains, like we're, we're building are super important, but then in order to really see progress in the world of atoms, we're gonna have to transduce the that potential of intelligence into the physical world. And so I think robotics is gonna see a boom in, in the coming years as we, you know, cross that threshold of having sort of, um, you know, match being able to have synthetic white collar intelligence i think there's a few year gap between we'll be uh, until we can uh solve motor intelligence or blue collar intelligence if you will and give people operational uh, uh leverage right you have intellectual leverage uh now with chan gpt but eventually you'll have operational leverage and that's where we're going to see serious progress in the world of atoms we're going to see deflation and the cost of building things in the real world and i think that's something everyone wants to see because things have slowed down far too much um, and so I'm really excited about that. And apart from that, obviously, uh, nuclear energy technologies, fusion is, is great, still pretty long timelines, but there's progress being made that's very tangible. 
and, and hopefully uh, fish in uh, that can work around all, all this over-regulation. Um, so those are the most exciting technologies. Love it. Well, we're working hard on that. Guillaume, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks.